Uh, Phil's going to kick us off this morning or this afternoon. Uh, Okay, what uh, we're trying to do in this talk is to look at uh, what has developed in the Craton Scale project since this time last year. Um, you can see the list of authors here that almost all the work was uh, David Mole. Uh, I kept him honest by uh, being aware of uh, the fundamentals of terrains and metallogeny and so on. So in 2020, we based the work solely on samples from the Abitibi subprovince. We provided an integrated view of lutetium hafnium and oxygen isotopes. And the paper that resulted was the first use of several trace element sets in zircon. We did not in that paper discuss the relationship to mineral deposits. So in the talk here, I'll uh, provide some background of the two isotopic systems of concern, and we'll work our way through what has gone on, what is going on, and uh, what lies in the future. So to start things off, get my, there we are. Looking at this slide, you can see the, first of all, on the vertical axis, epsilon hafnium, and on the horizontal axis, time uh, with conventional numbers. The red curve represents the lutetium hafnium system as it evolves through time. The lutetium hafnium system is broadly comparable to the samarium neodymium system in the sense that they're both isotopic systems that look at the evolution of rock types with time. Samarium neodymium is based on whole rock powders, whereas lutetium hafnium uses zircons. With lutetium hafnium, the parameter epsilon hafnium is greater than zero um, for young mantle-derived crust, whereas old crust has an epsilon hafnium generally less than zero. So we can see on the diagram here, um, mantle derived material, but we'll uh, progress without comment right here and look at one other parameter that we need to pay attention to, and that is the two stage model age. That is the age when a particular magma source separated from the mantle. So, looking at things here at 2.85, we have mantle derived material. It will evolve along this black line through to uh, a younger age, in this case through to 2600. And what we see is that the uranium lead age of the source material is 2850 and the mantle age, the model age, is also 2850. When we look at a later product, we're looking at a crystallization age of 2600, a mantle separation age of 2850, and we can talk in terms of the crustal residence age, the time that that 2600 million year material resided in the mantle, 250 million years. When we look at the oxygen system, we talk in terms of Delta 18 oxygen compared to standard mean ocean water expressed in mil, uh, per mil. The mantle zircon field ranges from 4.7 to 5.9. We can see it labeled there. And what we see is this, that so-called heavier values with higher numbers on the scale suggest a supracrustal component, in other words, um, low temperature hydrothermal processes. The heavier numbers down here suggest, yes, the heavier represents a supercrustal component. The lighter values suggest a high temperature hydrothermal component. And all this data is collected on zircons. Before David came to Laurentian, he looked at the Yilgarn craton in Australia 
uh, with samarium neodymium. And what we can see here is the fundamental architecture of the Yilgarn Craton, the Eastern Goldfield Superterrain, then this Ida Fault, and then this UNME terrain through here. Prior to doing the isotopic work, people looked at the granites as mantle probes, and they saw similar age ranges, they saw similar geochemistry, they couldn't understand then uh, how that craton had evolved. So then they applied samarium neodymium. When they did that, the Ida fault clearly separates older material in purple and blue from material more recently derived from the mantle. And this has a profound effect on what we understand about mineral deposits. Here we can see in the little yellow squares, uh, gold deposits. And uh, we can see that the gold prefers terrain boundaries uh, and is much more abundant in the more juvenile eastern part of the Ilgarn. We look at copper nickel PGEs associated with comatiites. Uh, they tend to concentrate along major terrain boundaries. David also looked at iron, but this is a special case that really only applies to um, how they define iron occurrences in the Ilgarn. So, in sum, the spatial application of samarium neodymium unveiled the cryptic architecture of the Ilgarn craton. It unveiled also apparent controls on three mineral systems. So, we can say that the crustal architecture defined in isotopic space is a first order control on the location of two major mineral systems. And we have a way of imaging it. We then move forward to the superior craton. And what we can see here, the green dots represent locales that have had uh, uranium lead uh, zircon ages obtained. We divided the craton into quadrants. And that first quadrant centered on the Abitibi. Um, we've done the data collection and the publication. We did it by looking at the zircons from dated samples. We subsampled the zircons and we performed a small amount of field work in undersampled areas. The imaging and the oxygen isotopes were collected at University of Alberta. The uranium lead dating, hafnium, and the trace elements on zircons were all done at Laurentian. We proceeded then from data collection through to producing map, map views, time slices, and so on. And that first quadrant is complete and published. Second quadrant, the southwest quadrant, is ongoing. The third quadrant, uh, we hope to get to um, that is very much finance dependent. So in this talk, I'm going to look at not just the Abitibi, which is what we did in the paper that's out. We're going to look at the neighboring terrains also. We're going to look at the Kappus casing structural zone, the Wawa, the Quetico, the Eastern Wabagoon, and the Opatica. Um, and this just illustrates uh, what uh, David is doing with respect to uh, um, the Southwest Superior. Uh, he's uh, um, adding some of these uh, red points to what we already had. Um, and you'll hear more about that uh, probably next year. So one of the things we did was to do um, mapping of the variability of lutetium hafnium. So on this sketch, we've got the Eastern Wabagoon here, Wawa through here, Kappus casing structural zone there, and then the Abitibi going through like so, and the Opatica up in here. And what we can see is this. The central part of this region is young, the fringes in 
blue and green are older. And when we look at the animation here, we can see uh, BMS deposits in green, copper nickel PGEs in red. The, as well as seeing the variability in the lutetium hafnium with an old center, with a, a young center and, and old fringes, we see that the oxygen data are lighter in the most juvenile regions, in other words, in through the center, particularly in the southern volcanic zone. Um, and we're going to look in this talk at synvolcanic mineralization, just VMS, and post-volcanic orogenic gold in the juvenile crust and at the edges of that juvenile block. So in this talk, we're going to look at uh, several slides in which we talk in terms of what's going on in the Abitibi on this slide and what goes on in the neighboring terrains. On many of these slides, you'll see a purple or a blue jagged line that represents a moving average. What we can see is that early on at 2.8, material was mantle derived. If we look at the progression through time in the Abitibi, we see more and more uh, crustal material with time. When we look at the non-Abitibi data, we see things going back to 2.9 um, in, um, in the, the uh, Winnipeg River. Um, and we can see, well, let's put it this way. We can talk in terms of integrating these two diagrams and talk in terms of a shared pre-2750 history for the Abitibi and the neighboring terrains. The new techniques that were applied in the earlier paper and are going to be applied here today, we use this expression to look at magma hydration. We measure oxygen fugacity, um, re reference to FMQ, and we look at tectonic environment by looking at uranium over YB. So as of right now, um, we've got all this terrain in through here to look at. And when we do that, and we look at the europium over europium star, et cetera, we're looking at hydration. And what do we see? We can think in terms of looking at hydrous magmas and if we've got amphibole crystallization, we inhibit plagioclase crystallization. Therefore, we concentrate ura uranium and <laughs> europium, and we uh, deplete yttrium. So looking at this, we can see um, the bounding curve between hydrous and less hydrous. So with time, the abitibi gets more hydrous, but yes, it's hydrous, but it's broadly similar to what is seen with respect to uh, the tholeites in Iceland. When we look outside the Abitibi, we see that between 2.75 and 2695, the range of values is very similar to what we saw in the Abitibi. But look out here, these blue samples are from the Kappa's casing structural zone, from mid crust, mid to deep crust. Um, and everything after 2670 or thereabouts is all greater than 10 up in this region here. So um, quite wet. So looking at oxygen fugacity, we analyzed the zircon grains for uranium, titanium, and cerium which all have, um, are, are, are all influenced by oxygen. And what we see is this, the moving average, we see a major increase at about 2695, like so, to more oxidized magmas. So taken together, all these observations suggest there is a major transition at 2695.
when we look at uh, uranium over ytterbium, looking at the abitibi, we can look at this diagram and talk in terms of a mantle field like so, a continental field like so. And what we're seeing is that after 2695, the data is all crustal. It starts out in part mantle and the mantle component decreases with time and then a big shift to 2695. Same thing, the purple line is the moving average. So at 2.8, we talk in terms of a broadly continental source and it becomes more crustal with time. The non abitibi data, again, at 2.9, continental. At 2.8, a mix of mantle and continental sources in through here. And during the volcanism of the Abitibi, 2.75 to 2695, everything is continental except Wawa and Opatica. And after 2695, everything's continental with the very high numbers for the capitalist casing structural zone melts. When we look at oxidation at 2.8, very reduced and everything is clustered close to zero when we look at 2750 to 2695, and then more oxidized after 2695. Okay, going beyond the Abitibi itself, we can look at this lutetium hafnium diagram, and we can see that Central juvenile area in orange. We can see the older material in green and blue. Um, so we can talk in terms of a young center and young northwestern part of the Abitibi and the southwestern part of the Abitibi and to a degree the Wawa. Um, the young zone is separated like so by older blocks. So we talk in terms of juvenile ne Neoarchean crust in the central Abitibi and evolved Neoarchean with a Mesoarchean component for the Wawa, the Opatica, and the Abitibi margins, leading us toward a rift interpretation. More on that later. So at 2695, we see an increase in Delta 18 oxygen, europium, et cetera, a decrease in epsilon hafnium, meaning that starting at 2695, more evolved continental crust, thoroughly oxidized, more hydrous, less juvenile. So a reduced mantle input after 2695, more crustal processes, and that synchronous across the abitibi and the non abitibi. So we had then a shared evolution prior to 2750. We'll then talk in terms of the evidence for a rift and we'll talk in terms of the possibility of <clears throat> initiation of subduction um, at the time of the Tisdale and Blake River toward 2.7. So looking at VMS, we have Eastern Wabagoon, Wawa, Abitibi, and we can see with the green stars the VMS deposits. There are in round numbers 800 million tons of VMS deposits in the diagram. The, there are three major episodes of development of VMS. During the Deloro time, 2730, early deposits, are, these are early deposits, they're zinc rich. When we get down to Blake River time at basically 2.7, we have high epsilon hafnium, juvenile and low delta 18 oxygen, which says high temperature hydrothermal systems. So again, juvenile crust in the central Abitibi, evolved Neoarchean with Mesoarchean component in non-Abitibi areas, and 
a crucial point here. The differences that we portray on these isotopic maps don't follow sub-province boundaries. We can talk in terms of the whole of this diagram consisting of one lump of Mesoarchean crust prior to 2.75. And then from 2750 to 2700 in round numbers, um, plume driven north-south extension. And there may be an association with transcrustal structures that are hosting the gold deposits that we see here with the yellow squares. So when we look at the Abitibi and the Yilgarn, the Eastern gold fields is well endowed in particular zones. The Abitibi is well endowed in particular zones. When we look at the Yilgarn, we see Comadiite nickel. In the Abitibi, we see a VMS. In the Yilgarn, the nearby crust is 500 million years older. In the Abitibi, the nearby crust is about 200 million years older. So the older crust in, the, in Australia is more buoyant, it's thicker, it's more resilient. In the Abitibi, by comparison, the crust is thinner, the crust and lithosphere combined are thinner, and that allows for rifting. Thus, late on in Abitibi history, we have mantle-derived melts at shallow levels and greater heat flow. When we look at gold, we can see the list of deposits here on the right, and we can see the individual deposits with the yellow squares. Um, we talk in terms of low gold deposits and magmatic deposits. Um, when we look at post 2695, we see increased in an increase in delta 18 oxygen, more oxidized, and the presence of sinucatoids. So hydrous and magmas with deeper origins. So oxidized and higher delta 18 oxygen. So at 26, post 2695, we transition from volcanism to deformation. We get crustal thickening, strain localization along major structures. Therefore, metamorphic fluids and a contribution from mantle sourced alkaline magmas um, and higher delta 18 oxygen representing a supercrustal source. And we need to remember that oxidized melts dissolve more gold. So during orogeny, we form major faults. The faults are a conduit for the CO2 rich mineralizing fluids. There is the influence of the Temiskaming and Kiwait unconformity. It's a regional scale control. And we'll look in a few slides at the Southern Volcanic Zone and its associated rift. That rift provides source zones and transatmospheric structures like the Porcupine Duster. Fluids derived from the dehydration of basalts, uh, dehydration of supercrustals, leached fluids from basaltic sources. We'll just look at uh, the architecture of the rift. What we see on the rift is northern volcanic zone, southern volcanic zone, and on the north zone and the south zone, we see old rocks, 2790 and 2766. Up the middle, younger. That's the evidence for the rifting. Uh, and uh, this summary diagram correlates with prospectivity, especially for BMS, and uh, gold appears to reuse uh, these terrain block margins. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Phil.